very much, uh, Asti, and a very good afternoon to everybody that's uh, Asia side. A very good morning to those of you that are joining us from the UK or Europe. Um, it's an ab absolute pleasure for me to do this welcome in what is the 10th anniversary year of the Britcham Professional Women's Group. Um, I'm going to leave more about the group to Sonny. I'm also going to leave more about the uh, guests that we have for you because we really want to use every little drop of time that's available uh, to be able to eke out all the guidance, all the hints, all the insights that may be useful to you in your lives and your careers. Before I pass over to Sonny, uh, I'd just like to express our sincere appreciation to our sponsors. They are the British International School, Brompton, Cushman and Wakefield, Michael Page, Indonesia, and Shell, Indonesia. As Asti mentioned, there'll be a recording available and we'll encourage you to share it far and wide with your friends and your communities. Our ambassador will be joining us later on in this particular presentation and webinar. Sonny, over to you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and thank you everyone uh, for joining us today. Happy International Women's Day. Thank you for joining this special session where we are celebrating 10 years of the Professional Women's Group. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, the Professional Women's Group is the only women's group uh, with, uh, under the British Chamber of Commerce. And we are the only chamber in the European sector that has a women's group. So we've been uh, really frontliners for the last 10 years thanks to the far-sightedness and vision of Chris, together with four women members, founders, who are still with us today. Some of them are still our members, and I am really honored and blessed to have been part of this group for the last 10 years. And we've had really amazing uh, speakers joining us from Facebook, Yahoo, Google, Lazada, Blibli, Unilever, Nestle, L'Oreal, we've had ministers, celebrities, and we've had really uh, coaches and other uh, top ranking officials, you know, people who've really devoted their time to help us to grow as a community and as a group. And our tagline is to share, elevate, empower, and to connect. And today in line with professional, uh, with the International Women's Day, we have chosen the topic of challenge. You know, I'm encouraging everyone to rise up and take a challenge, challenge yourself to grow. And then choose a community. If you haven't, if you are not part of any women community, you are please welcome to join us because it's women who can mentor and help one another and then collaborate, make an effort to team up with other people and then make a change. This is now the time for each and every one of us to challenge and change ourselves. As Gandhi said, we need to be the change that we wanna see in this world. And so accordingly, we have got an amazing lineup of women who are joining us today. And to begin with, I invite Liao Xu Wei. Xu Wei is the uh, Regional Vice President External Relations for Shell in Asia. And she has been in this role for the last 15 years. And she has also been with Shell for the last 26 years. Xiao Wei, I now invite you to please share your journey with Shell. And how did you know that this is what you wanted to do You know, when you were a little girl? Thank you. Thank you, Sony. Thank you, um, British Chamber of Commerce. And thank you for the Professional Women's Network to have me here. Uh, on this special day for women. And I said to Chris just before the opening, it's also for men. Thanks for being there, for supporting us. Um, my story is long and a bit complicated, but I'll do it in maybe 30 seconds to one minute. I joined Xiao in China when China just started opening up. Uh, actually, I jumped the ship from the government organization for personal growth because I wanted to see the bigger world. So that is on the personal side of things. After joining Shell, I also see the potential that I can also be a global 
uh, um, global executive or global citizen. So therefore I traveled with Xiao to work in the UK, in the Netherlands, and 10 years ago coming here in the region to take up the regional leadership role for a function that look after uh, 13 um, countries, 15 markets with a team of more than 100 people in different uh, uh, nationalities and all that. So what uh, motivates me is really my core value, one of them is to be helpful in a way that for to be helpful for the organization I work with, to be helpful and supportive to the team that I lead, uh, and of course, to be helpful with family and friends, uh, and in the broadest sense. Uh, and I have been lucky enough to be nurtured and developed by leaders who have empowered me and entrusted me, this including men and women. And as I develop from you know, individual contributor to a leader of com community, I think it's time to pay back and to do my bit to help the community to grow, particularly women. Thank you. Um, you were handling 15 countries, right? Can you tell us how do you do that, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, having so many countries that you need to look after? Yeah. So I have very simple framework to guide my work. Uh, I have this 3P principle. Uh, I know that people know 3P for sustainability, people, planet, and profit. And the 3P for me also starts with P, people that is really taking a people-centric approach uh, in everything we do, because I people make it happen. And of course, that also leads to my second P, meaning that we have to have a clear plan, a well-defined plan. People know what we're going to do, what's the objective we're trying to achieve. And of course, the last P is performance. You know, How do we manage uh, empower people to have to develop the right skill, the competence, to be able to enjoy what they're doing, uh, having that sense of achievement, but also to be the best they can when they come to work. So simple guidelines. Um, there's a lot of to get into the details, but uh, you know, building a strong team definitely will help us to achieve what we wanted to achieve. And to be proudly announced here that Asia Pacific, my team, had been leading the dashboard for the global for the last two years, eight quarters in a row. Wow, congratulations and sounds really a uh, very, very a tremendous responsibility on your part. I see that when I studied your bio that you are a strengths based coach. Can you tell us how do you mentor and help your the women communities within Shell? Yeah, so Strength Finder, I don't know whether people know about this, uh, a bit of that. Strength Finder is um, uh, developed by uh, Don Clifton, one of the founders of Gallup. And they've done um, multiple years, four decades of work and interviewed hundreds and thousands of successful people, not just financially successful, this including the likes of Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, but also successful teachers, nurses, doctors, um, government officials, um, people like yourself, diplomats maybe. Uh, and they found that you know, the 34 traits of talents that everyone has, but they divided that further into four domains, like you know, execution, influential, uh, relational, and analytical. Uh, in a nutshell, we all have those uh, talents in us. It's just in a different order. So your domain or your signature, uh, you know, naturally who you are, you are good at doing things without, you know, the efforts. And probably people don't know that. So once you've done the test, uh, then you know who you are, what you're good at. And the philosophy is really based on positive psychology. So basically, you know, uh, let's leverage your strengths so that you can, you can become the best version of yourself. And I'm a strong believer in, in uh, leverage people's strengths. And I've been doing this with my team. So everyone bring their strengths to work and we can uh, leverage each other's strengths for the optimum uh, outcome as a team. And I've been doing that with, within the team, uh, outside the team, in the industry, and, and particularly with women. And this has been done in the last four years since I've become a certified a strength finder coach. Um, and uh, I'm also coaching to, uh, today. You probably can read a LinkedIn post about Prospect, an industry uh, organization who started 
an industry mentoring program last year. So I've been coaching people outside Xiao women as well. Uh, and has been um, incredible to see, you know, once people become aware of who they are, what they're good at, and they can becoming so much more confident and knowing that how to leverage their strengths to achieve what they aim to achieve in life and work. Thank you. I think that this is something that we all need to remember that instead of focusing on our weaknesses, we should acknowledge and focus on our strengths and also appreciate other people's strengths, especially yes. within our team. Thank you. I will get back to you, but now I will introduce our next uh, panelist, that is Alamanda Shantika Santoso. Alamanda, thank you for joining us today. And uh, uh, Mariko introduced me to you, and she said to me that you were previously at Gojek, and now you are the founder and president director at Bi Binar Academy. And uh, apparently, Mariko has invested in that. So she spoke <laughs> amazingly about you. I read your profile on LinkedIn, and I was very amazed. So please tell thank us you, about yourself. You, what made you open up Binar Academy? Yeah, so thank you so much, Sonny and everyone. Um, hi, hello, everyone. And yeah, a little bit about my journey. I think um, I started coding since I was like 14 years old when my, my, my friends um, like playing a uh, doll, I, I, I could. <laughs> and I mostly uh, played like a toy cars and so on. So yeah, um, and, and I started in this industry, which is uh, digital tech startups since 11 years ago. Um, I, I built my first company when I was 21 years old. And then I joined um, a, a small software house and then I met Nadim Makarim in Kartuku and I joined Gojek. So I was the first who built the, the Gojek app from the very beginning. Um, GoFood was my, my, yeah, my, my, one of my products. Uh, and yeah, Go, uh, other 14 products in Gojek. So I built the tech team from the very, very, very beginning. And um, after I quit Gojek in um, October 2016, I built Binar Academy because um, I see a lot of uh, short, shortage in the digital tech talent. And um, the information gap in Indonesia is very huge um, between like Java compared to outside Java. So I think um, I always believe that education must be the forefront of everything and I um, I totally agree with Liu like I, I couldn't build Gojek app without my team and I couldn't um, build my dream in Binar Academy without my team so education must be at the very forefront of everything because um, with education we can evolve uh, people so yeah I think that's a little bit about my journey I see Sunny. that you have a Binar Academy app and you're teaching online and you have students in 33 cities across Indonesia. Yeah, correct. Can you tell us how to do the, what kind of coaching or training are you giving online? Yeah, so we're, we're giving a um, digital skill, uh, yeah, digital skills uh, from like uh, product management, um, UI UX and also Android and um, full stack web development. And we don't only teach about the technical skills, but we also teach the transferable skills that we really need right now. Because um, I, I always believe that um, we also need the hard um, and the soft skill, not only the technical skill. So yeah, that's a little bit about Binar Academy and you can download our app. And um, we also um, provide mentor to give feedback because we believe that uh, the psychosocial aspect and learning is still needed, not only like a one-way interaction, 
but we also need uh, like a feedback for from the mentors because we can improve ourselves from from that feedback so if i'm not mistaken your app is actually available free of charge yeah that's there's a premium uh, material that you can access through our app okay what i've been reading is that you used to be called the mother of ojek drivers and now you <laughs> are the godmother of 1000 startups is that correct <laughs> is that your vision for your future yeah yeah i i help a thousand startup digital um um program by the minister of um information and i i was there in i think 2016 and then i and then i landed in binar academy after that very good well we'll come back to your dreams and aspirations let me uh, introduce our next panelist and that is dia roro st vidya putri or Roro Esti, as she would like us to call her. Now, Roro Esti, I was very impressed when I met you at the Indian ambassador's home uh, last month, because I saw that you are such a young lady, and yet you're a member of the parliament of Indonesia. And then you are also representing uh, the technology and uh, uh, research energy sectors. And uh, I just wanted to, you to share with us what made you decide to become a member of parliament at such a young age? And can you share with us your journey uh, from childhood until today, till you decided to, that this is the, the, what you want to do? Yeah, um, firstly, thank you very much, Sony and uh, for, uh, for Bridgem for the invitation for having me here today. And I'd like to Firstly, say happy International Women's Day to everybody here and also everyone um, present and listening to our conversation at the moment. Uh, thank you also for the question. Um, I've actually spent uh, quite a long time in the UK. So I grew up in you know, seven cities and five countries overall, because at the time my father used to work for BP. So he used to work for uh, an oil and gas company and we moved around uh, quite a lot. And that included seven years of my life uh, in the UK. So that, you know, extended to me doing my undergrad at the University of Manchester for four years, uh, alongside a postgraduate diploma after that. And then I continued on into doing my master's with the um, uh, scholarship from the Ministry of Finance, uh, the LP LPDP uh, scholarship uh, into doing my master's at Imperial College London uh, for a year. So I've been in the UK for seven years um, of my life before deciding, you know, my, the turning point was actually when I um, got the scholarship from the government and I was doing my master's in the UK at the Center of Environmental Policy. And I, I reached a point in my life where I thought, you know what, it's, it's time for me to, to come back to Indonesia. And um, one of the ways that, you know, in creating change uh, at the time I felt was for me to create those changes by moving back to Indonesia, uh, by living in Indonesia and, and creating those, those changes. And my vision from the very beginning was how I can contribute in creating a sustainable future for the country, right? And so what happened uh, initially before I, you know, went on into going through with um, the campaign at the time and going into politics and now as a parliamentarian, uh, before that, uh, my brother and I, who um, did his master's at NYU at the time, we decided to come up with an idea, um, and that was called the Indonesian Energy and Environmental Institute. So we developed a, uh, an institution which, again, seeks to create the sustainable future. We understood that in order to do so, there needs to be a top-down approach as well as a bottom-up approach, right? And so uh, we recognize that changes happen through um, decision making processes that happen at the high, uh, high level, I would say, but also changes can also happen um, by, you know, um, uh, gathering communities and having our voices heard um, uh, from the bottom up onwards. And so we um, did a lot of projects 
uh, we worked alongside the Ministry of Environment, uh, the Ministry of Energy and Research as well uh, for a couple of uh, the things that we did. And uh, not long after, so it was three years of doing this uh, until I realized, you know, the more I learned, the more I realized um, how important it was to have more people with this kind of mindset um, within the system. Right. And so I think a lot of women um, and I think a lot of people generally feel quite skeptical about the political landscape, uh, whether in Indonesia or anywhere else in the world. And one of the main factors is because, you know, we see more of a negative stereotype associated to the political world. And so um, at the time I felt, you know what, I think there needs to be change that occurs by braving ourselves to be a part of the system. And so that was another calling that I experienced um, at the time. And so now, um, luckily, and I'm very blessed uh, to have had this opportunity and to have the trust of, you know, uh, the people that I represent. Right now, I represent um, uh, an area in East Java uh, of Grisik and Lamongan. So these are the, the cities that I represent with a population combined of 2 million people. And so I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to represent them in, in Parliament. And now I'm able to really just experience firsthand how how much our voice matters, you know, and how by saying something we're able to create such significant changes, uh, changes that I felt um, I wasn't able to do before uh, at a more grander uh, scheme. And so one of the things that I guess maybe we can, we can um, elaborate on this later on, but one of our goals right now at Commission 7, which is where I've been entrusted in, uh, which you know uh, deals with the energy sector and also the research and te technology sectors, is how we can um, realize the Paris Agreement that's been agreed upon, right? We have a target of decreasing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the energy sector plays an, uh, a prominent role in CO2 emissions as well. We recognize this. And so one of the things that we're currently pushing is uh, um, a legislation on renewable energy. And that includes, you know, how we can um, um, regulate in a way where renewables can be more competitive within the energy market. That includes, you know, regulating the pricing and also incentives and so forth. And as, as a woman, if I can also share, um, I think one of the main tools or one of the main things that we have to have is, is uh, I think not only strength, but also bravery, right? To voice out the things that we feel matter um, and one of the, you know, one of the pushes that I felt at the time, and even up until now, is that it's time that we, you know, push for legislations that are impactful, not only within the five years down the line, but really just 20 years down the line or 50 years down the line going forward. And that in itself is, is the very essence of creating a sustainable future for the country. And I'm, I'm grateful that everyone in my committee um, has the same uh, vision. And so that makes my job easier as well. And so now that's, uh, that's what we're currently working on in, in Parliament. Thank you, Sony, for the Thank question. Thank you. Thank you, Roro Esti. I, I also followed you on Instagram and on Twitter, and I see that you are sending uh, daily messages, and it's really remarkable. And I see that you're following up from your passion, which is debating, that you took part in several United Nations debates and conferences. Mm -hmm. And I'm uh, really happy to see because my niece, one of my nieces, she's also very active with the United Nations and debating. And I'm it's great. so nice to see young you know, people in their 20s or even younger uh, taking up causes to make a difference to the world. And I think yeah. it brings me to the next question that I would like to ask the three of you. With, I will go back to Xiaowei now. The fact that Dia touched on the, you know, that you have to be fearless and you have to stand up and uh, dare to speak up. Can you please elaborate on a situation which, where you were asked to do this, shall we? 
well, the many, <laughs> the many occasions uh, that we have to do this. Uh, oh, so I think there's an internal and external bit. Yeah. So from the uh, maybe share one little story when I was still maybe uh, in rural Estes age, <laughs> joined the company not that long ago. Um, you know, we have a very strong business principle. And China then I was I was in China was just opening up. So there's a lot of changes going through in the system, including you know in media, in government, in industry. Uh, we just started opening um, a big investment plant in one of the coastal cities in China, and I had the local uh, media coming up to the event for the ground laying ceremony. And at the end of the ceremony, this local uh, TV station uh, crew coming up to me say, okay, you either pay me 3000 RMB or I drop the story. And that caught me in surprise and not to say this is also in front of many other media from the local and the central provinces. So uh, I know, I mean, uh, this is my, <laughs> my area of uh, responsibility. We do have um, a, a business principle. We never pay for media coverage. And uh, I just turn around and say, um, you know, we won't pay for it. If you feel this investment is significant for the city, do the news as you see it, it's worse. Yeah. Otherwise, feel free to do whatever you wanted to do with this piece of information. Um, I mean, I was in my like 20s and I'm facing this group of media and also this very influential local TV station. Yeah. So you guess what? I actually gained a lot of media friends out of that conversation when they observed me doing what I did. And after that, you know, the TV station decided to actually report without asking for money. And number one, I stood by the company value. It's also my own value as well. And secondly, um, you know, pick up with that uh, bravery to say, you know, have the courage to say no. Uh, because you are adhering to your value and your belief. Uh, so that's one uh, little example uh, to say, you know, doing your job professionally, but also, you know, it is underpinned by the belief and value you have and the company has. Um, internally, there are times that um, I grown up uh, and still young, maybe junior to some of the uh, more senior, particular female uh, le uh, leaders. Sometimes they can be a bit demanding to say that I have to do this and just get me through the approval process internally. And I have stood up multiple times just to say reason why we couldn't do what we couldn't do because of, you know, there is a company procedure or process, or it is not appropriate from communication perspective, whether it's audience or whether it's the channel. Um, I have a reason. So to be able to, uh, to give that, um, you know, your own reasoning and to be able to stood by what you believe is right for the company and from pro professional perspective is important. And that require, of course, number one, you know the subject, you are the subject of uh, matter experts. Number two, you know, um, I'm doing what I think is right for the company, for the reputation, for the brand. And that is the, you know, the kind of driver behind me saying no or being at the times to be the police person. Uh, to get things right. Thank you, Xiaowei. Alamanda, I see that you are also very big into fierce, fearless living and daring to speak up and standing up for your rights. Can you share with us? You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think the the most um, funny thing that I always faced is that um, every time like people ask me about why I've been in this man industry, which is the digital industry, I always ask them back, uh, why not? And why you ask this question? Because I never, uh, I never uh, thought that this industry is a man industry. So I think, um, yeah, from, from my experience 11 years in this industry, I never faced uh, the challenge of being women in technology and I never felt any different in terms of the opportunity from 
from my peers, especially when I was working in the technology division. Uh, I think it's because that I, I never had this notion that tech industry is an industry for men. Uh, so I think the problems in this ecosystem is not uh, on the opportunity, but we don't have any enough uh, women tech talent. Because when I led the Gojek team back in 2015, we only had around 10% women. Even though as someone um, who hired all the team member, I never differentiate between men and women, but I've seen um, a growing number in Binar Academy. Um, we have around like two third women sitting in the board level and 60% women in the managerial position. So if I, and, and if I look at uh, based on our internal data in Binar Academy, our uh, women student has grown from 10% for our first year to 40% in our third year. Um, and I think as a women founder or entrepreneur, I also feel the privilege because of uh, a lot of venture capital out there are investing in women-led founders. So again, I think no doubt uh, at, about the opportunity because we as a women has a huge opportunity uh, in, in this space. And for me, like um, the, the, the challenge is always in ourself because uh, our value depends on how we value ourselves, right? And it all begins from, from our mind. Um, and we can break it. And I think the biggest obstacle is really in our mindset. Uh, when you change your thoughts, I think the circumstances will change. So I think to all women out there, um, just, just break the notion of um, women cannot do what men do. Thank you. That is very, very good message, Alamanda. Thank you so much. And Thanks, Sonny. Roro Esti, would you like to add? Exactly, sure. especially in the political, because I think many of the young Indonesians are thinking that, oh, you know, it's too difficult to make a change. What is your message? Yeah, so um, I think going back to when I was campaigning at the time, yeah, in 2019, um, I was kind of con not conditioned I would say conditioned but everyone around me um, made it seem as though my age and my gender was a weakness right um, and so very few people thought that I would be able to be where I was today and so that was a moment where I felt like I needed to be strong internally for me to be able to uh, obtain what I felt was possible for me, which was uh, at the time a seat in parliament. And so what I did internally was re really just shifting what was deemed to be a weakness, you know, uh, because I was young and because I'm a woman, uh, especially in, in a sector that is predominantly men, you know, there is more men in politics than there are women. And so that was what kind of just encouraged me to shift the mindset of making what was seen to be weakness in becoming my strength. You know, um, the fact that I'm young means that, you know, I'm, I can be more mobile, um, you know, I can do more. And the fact that I'm a woman, I can have certain sensi sensitivities uh, towards certain issues uh, that maybe weren't, um, weren't a focus uh, before, you know, I, I think, uh, women being in all sectors, whether it be politics or any kind of industry, is, is very important because it, it enables kind of like a, a discussion that is more well-rounded, right? And so um, it, it became kind of like an, an encouragement for me generally. Right now, 20%, uh, around 20% of uh, the parliamentarians are women, right? So only 20%. And that you know, equates to around 118 people. Uh, we have a threshold of 30% at the Indonesian parliament. 
And I hope to see uh, in future that number rising even more. And so one of our goals as women parliamentarians, myself and all my colleagues, is to set an example um, you know, and, and really just change the narrative around politics generally. So more women can be, um, you know, can have the courage to want to start um, and, and to venture off in, in, this, in this space that again um, is predominantly uh, men, right? And, and we wanna make sure that there is a sense of transparency as well. So more people know of what goes on internally within the system uh, for that to then hopefully encourage them to want to be a part of the system because we need more uh, women, of course, uh, we need more women pol political leaders um, policy makers uh, and so so that we can really just fight for um, issues that that we feel are also quite relevant for the country going forward. Thank you, dear Roro. Uh, we've had quite a lot of questions from uh, our participants and one question that came uh, several times uh, which is very uh, surprising because I think all panelists will agree with me that women have never had it so good, right? The, for the situation for women today and the opportunities that are available for women today, as well as the uh, education and uh, the, the understanding that women have today is, is the best that it has ever been. Despite that, in Asian countries especially, there are many restrictions on cultural views, perceptions, which stop women from rising up into leadership roles. And even within families, if a woman is not a mother as well as a career woman, she is not um, encouraged by her mother or her mother. Do you have these situations in your um, immediate uh, groups? And how do you? How? What advice would you give someone that is facing? such a challenge. Thank you. Shall we, maybe we can begin with you. Yeah, thank you, Sonny. Uh, indeed, and you know, there are, you know, so-called so societal expectations of women and sometimes they are stereotyped. I think uh, uh, Rosa, Esti and uh, Alameda earlier said it really well, you know, don't set the limitation for ourselves, others can, but it is up to us, you know, it's, it's the, your own belief, internal strengths, and it's also, you know, the value, the motivation that you have. So be clear about who you are and what you want to achieve as step number one. That will be my advice. Uh, so be yourself and know your strengths. Um, and even in uh, Roro Estes case, I'm, I'm impressed to say that, you know, she said, you know, people thinking she's young, a woman, and she turned that into a positive outcome. Yeah, young being, you know, you know, have a bigger dream, and and women are more sensitive, and um, you know, men and women are built different, and the, and we all bring different perspective into uh, the workplace, into family, and uh, diversity in itself is a strength. You know, the the different perspective, the more different perspective we can consider, the better decision we will have, and there's multiple studies to prove that as well. So that is the number one, you know, to be confident who we are. Secondly, I think it's also too important to build allies and this including, you know, within family, within your friend circle, in workplace, and of course, um, in society, if we can do like what you are doing, Sonny, uh, amazingly 10 years to build a women's network, that is a support network for women who have bigger dreams, you know, you can hear each other's challenge and also inspire each other and provide each other with tips and advices how to overcome them and, and you know, forum like this is also a great opportunity and also find role models I think that's also very important in for myself you know growing up I always say I wanted to be this person or that kind of person and, and that encourage you when you, you know, temporarily having setback you could say I can do it and many times probably I'm um, our parents or mother could be our role model in different ways the way that they thrive through hardship you know economically we're much better off but the way that they thrive and in their ages to be who they are I think is very inspiring at least in my case uh, I was inspired by my mom even though he she hasn't got the kind of education uh, she I have 
but she has enabled all of us to go through that kind of education uh, we have. Thank you. Alamanda, would you like to add to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I think um, this, this kind of um, traumatic or fear that we have, um, it's not only happen in women, also in men. So um, for me, like our brain is like a computer where it is programmed. When we were in age um, seven to uh, zero to seven years to twenty ish, and um, all that past traumatic has been programmed in our brain, and sometimes. Um, Sometimes we face some, some challenge and then we feel afraid by that. So I think um, first you should know yourself better. Um, you should know where this came from. And then um, when, when it happened to you, then you understand and you, you are very aware of um, is this some, some emotion that rise up uh, from from my childhood or um, your your early your early days, and I think uh, the, the the third thing is that um, when this happen, we need to have the empathy um, to our environment because um, maybe someone who done something to us, they don't know that um, it will hurt ourselves. So having this empathy is really important. And after we understand why they uh, did that to us, um, the, the last thing is very important is that we need to forgive ourselves and we need to forgive others. So then we can move forward in our life. Wow, thank you. That is so uh, impactful and powerful. Forgive ourselves and forgive others. Unfortunately, we are already uh, in the last 20 minutes of our session. I would like to hand over to Chris Wren so that he has a chance to ask you ladies a question and then introduce our celebrity panelist today, Karina Salim. So Chris, over to you, although you know I could go on and on. Thank you. <laughs> yes, yes, Sonny, I do know you could. Um, but in fairness, in fairness, you could be forgiven because this has been a tremendous panel. Thank you very, very much indeed. And, and probably with the time constraints in mind, I just have one question. I, I think each of you have so much more to share the wider international community and networks that Britcham engages. And I would like to ask for one simple commitment from each of you, if I may, would you please come and join us and share more uh, in the context, not just of professional women, uh, but in the context of building careers uh, in the international space, whether that be uh, corporate, whether it be through education and digital and incubators, or whether that be through government. Would you please come and join us on other platforms with Britcham? That's a hands up. Yes. That's another hands up. That's two hands up. Okay, that's great. Thank, thank you both very much. Uh, thank you both. Thank you all very much. Um, yes, as, as Sonny mentioned, uh, we, we have a guest who is not a new guest to Britcham. Um, actually, it was 2015, um, I believe. Um, somewhat younger, obviously, five or six years younger. Karina Salim joined us when uh, Prime Minister David Cameron was visiting Indonesia and Britcham was running a series of events um, and we wanted to showcase our professional women's group. It was very, very important to us. And we, we had um, uh, Ibu Susi, who at the time was Minister of Maritime. Uh, we also had Anna Subri, who was the British Minister for Small and Medium Enterprises. Um, and we also had Diane Sastro and Karina Salim was, was our guest. Um, at that time, very much the, uh, the youngest of them all. Um, Karina, uh, a few years has passed. Uh, would you be kind enough just to very, very briefly give us a few highlights of what's happened since last time uh, you took the stage with Britcham? Is it clear now? Yes, it is, yeah. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, first of all, I would like to say thank you very much for inviting me. It's, it's so much pleasure and uh, it's an honor for me. And it's very inspiring hearing all of your story. It's, wow, thank you very much for sharing with me. Um, so key moment, I got pregnant, Chris, and on that period of time, I got contract with one of local television to be one of the leading cast in the situation comedy series. So they're making me a character who is on pregnancy also. I was actually very happy that I got a job while I'm pregnant. So it's a win-win for my career and personal life that I don't need to postpone. But here comes all the consequences. So it is not easy at all having uncomfortable sensation while pregnant in your body inside a shooting location because my workplace is not like your workplace. I don't work in a, in a, in a comfortable chair or clean toilet, clean, clean space, quiet place. In shooting, it is not like that. It's not in an office. No air conditioner at all. And it's very hard for a pregnant lady. And on my labor day, after the birth of my baby, I did a shooting also. So all the staff and the crew came to my hospital when I got my C-section operation. It's very not comfortable at all. And after only two months of not me to leave, that is another challenge. Uh, I was still breastfeed. So I got a pump for the milk every two to three hours in a shooting location. Pump and that is very gorgeous. Sometimes the breast milk is blocked. I got fever, pain. I tried in a location and suddenly the fridge on a location is not working. So I got to throw away all the expired milk that I already pumped all day. So it's a very a golden experience that I think that is my personal goal and answer. While all the guys or younger actress at that time seen juggling those things on the location, doing that pumping and having painful cry in the big pain pregnancy in nine months, a very big stomach at that time, they might see it something, yeah, not so special, but for me personally, uh, it's not easy and I'm very proud of myself that I can overcome it. Only women can do it, I think that's why not give all that they do to us. Now, th thanks very much. I mean, obviously what you've described is, is something that's so difficult for of men actually to to empathize with but i i think i think we all do appreciate that that women do have this unique balancing act to play between uh work career development um and and of course playing the the role of of wife and mother in sometimes in difficult circumstances um karina i think we we know that covid has uh, has impacted many uh many businesses many careers uh, many pursuits of uh, setting up companies and so on. And obviously it's also impacted. Sorry. The, are you there? It, it's also impacted the, um, uh, the, the entertainment business as well. Uh, in, in terms of, um, in terms of shooting, have you, have you been able to do much recently? And uh, if not, what new challenges have you been giving to yourself during the COVID downtime in your particular um, uh, sector? Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, Chris, 2019 was my first year of comeback after a long maternity leave in a film industry, not in TV, so it's different. So I shoot three films that year, and the first one is already uh, released in Cinema XX1. It's uh, January last year. We almost hit 1 million audiences at that time. And suddenly there's this news, three to 10 people just got infected COVID-19. So the cinema directly closed. And my second movie that is about to release, we're just about to do a movie premiere in a week. We've already prepared the dress for a red carpet and all, and it, it is all canceled. And finally, a year after, we, all of us, director, producers, uh, art, director of photography, cameraman, Everyone, we as a worker in film industry, we not yet have a job. And it's really bad for film industry in creative industry. Uh, and of course, for a woman like me, entering 30 year old, 
still have a plan, of course, to have another baby, I was a bit depressed at the first of COVID pandemic. Because for me, two years not working is such a waste. I mean, the thought of, oh, I better got pregnant last year, so I don't waste so much long time not working. Because, you know, working in the entertainment industry is not so long term, you know, just like you in a company, as you get older, you get higher salary, more settled. But for us and as an artist, uh, we only have a very short prime time. You know, if we get older, then yeah, that's it. Uh, but if we have another side business, that's okay. But for, um, yeah, if you know what I mean. So, and yeah, it affects and hit the most actually about the COVID thing. You, you heard Karina, um, our earlier guests, talk about the the impact of education, whether it's on their personal lives or how they are uh, putting back into the, um, the the learning of, of younger people. I know that when you first joined us uh, six years ago, um, you you had your own passion for wanting to uh, get involved in educating within communities and so on. Um, uh, how has that gone and what are you doing now? Yeah, uh, there's someone uh, told me five years ago that she asked me what I want to be in the future and I'm telling all the ambitions that I want. I want to be this under, before I got 30 years old, I want this, 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 this. And she said to me very simple that, uh, Karina, no matter how kind people are, no matter how talented people, how, no, no matter how smart, they should always give benefits to others. There should be a purpose for it. It's not always about ourselves. So we we need to giving light to other people to share. At least for you as an actress, you need to, maybe you, you can be a teacher or following any kind of, you know, just, just to give, just to give. So I think about it. Now I teach also. I teach in the John Robert Powers, if anybody knows. Uh, yeah, I think that is one of my, I, I've never, I never want to be a teacher or, but I don't know, when the first time I try to teach and I see all the participants understand and getting better in their life through my story, it's another, uh, what is it? Maybe not only satisfaction, but I feel just complete. That's, yeah. So uh, that is my long-term, long-term um, purpose for me too. Long-term, long-term uh, objectives then to deliver more back in terms of education. Yeah. That's great, and and I think you heard that two of our panelists managed to launch their careers uh, through having an education back in the UK. So uh, perhaps you can add that to your ambition list as well, Karina. Um, all right. Um, it, it's been a pleasure to, to welcome you back here. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, do, do stay with us because um, actually we, we've got a gentleman who I've heard him describe himself as a career diplomat. And um, as we all know, uh, for career diplomats, um, all the world's a stage, isn't it? Um, Owen Jenkins, ambassador, please, please join us and share a few thoughts on this. Uh, International Women's Day. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, that's that's a very intimidating introduction in the presence of an actor of, of Ibu Karina's quality. Um, uh, I won't I won't claim to that, uh, but I am delighted to be able to be part of, of today's event. Um, and let me just kick off by congratulating Britcham and in particular the professional uh, women's group, uh, both for this event, which I think is tremendously important. Uh, but more importantly, for the, the 10 years of activity which the group has been has been doing, uh, I do think it's extraordinary um, that Britcham is still the only European Chamber of Commerce to have a women's group like this uh, when the need for it is uh, is so clear. Um, and I think it's uh, in that context even more impressive uh, that Ibu Soni and her colleagues um, have been for 10 years plowing this furrow and uh, finding the way to identify, to promote, to sponsor and to showcase women's talent across so many sectors. And I think it's a real tribute to, to Britcham, um, frankly. I think that it shows 
that uh, this is a this is an organization which is not only committed to narrow commercial interests it's not something which is just about selling things it's it recognizes the broader social purpose of, of business um, and i think that's uh, a tremendous value um, in Britcham and in particular in the professional women's group and frankly it's what makes the uh, the chamber such a fantastic partner for for the embassy and we're really proud to uh, to be able to work with Britcham on these issues as as on many um i was sorry i, I had to miss the start of the uh, of the seminar i was in a ministerial um, call between our, our ministers of trade um, but even in the uh, in the discussion that i caught it was absolutely fascinating to hear stories from different parts of, uh, of our worlds. Um, one thing which, which diplomats do have the privilege of doing is, is getting a little bit of insight um, into a whole range of different worlds, whether that's business, politics, health, security, even entertainment from time to time. Um, we're, we're, we're dreadfully inexpert in any of it, um, but we see a little bit of all of it. Um, and the stories that I've been hearing today and the advice and the guidance which uh, which I've heard from from the panelists and from from our uh, star guest panelist Ibu Karina I think has been has been really inspiring and I think that it's also shown why this event was needed it is those purposes of uh, of identifying of promoting of showcasing of uh, of supporting uh, women's talent and this is something that the embassy also tries to do. So we recognize that we have privilege, we have a position where we can make a difference uh, to these things. So whatever we do, we try to make sure that we promote women's talent, that we promote women's ability to engage. And that can be in any area, whether it's a renewable energy project, which could contribute to the ability of women to, to get education or, to uh, start businesses from home. Um, sometimes it's about our digital inclusion projects, uh, which focus on promoting women's entrepreneurships in micro and medium, uh, small and medium sized enterprises. Sometimes it's about uh, health outcomes where women can be disproportionately impacted. And what people Karina has just said, I think brings home the reality of that. So we have to remember um, that in our position of privilege, we can make a difference in all of the sectors uh, that we touch. And I promise I will try to do my own part in this, however small that might be. Um, and today I've, I've been very pleased um, alongside other ambassadors in, in Jakarta to promise um, in a, a very small thing, but um, I've pledged not to appear again on panels, on webinars or seminars, which have all male panels. Uh, uh, so women, must be present, there must be gender balance um, in a substantive way on any future webinar, panel or seminar, which I, which I attend as a speaker. Um, that's a commitment I've made alongside others. Please hold me to it. Um, hold the embassy to the promises that we make uh, to support gender inclusion and support women's empowerment in everything we do. Um, tell me when we're not doing it properly and I'm sure we will fail. We all fail from time to time. Um, and as we've we've heard, we must forgive ourselves for that, but we also must do better. This event today is a really important part of, of making all of that into a reality. I think it's fantastic to see such women's talent coming together. I'm proud that the embassy in its small way can play a part in supporting that. So thank you for allowing me uh, to join the, the webinar today. Um, and I look forward to, to the rest of the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Ambassador Owen Jenkins uh, for your comments, giving a few perspectives of the embassy in its support of uh, women and talent. And I think it's you and I that are creating the balance here today on, on this particular panel on, and with among the attendees as well. Thank you, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'd just now like to pass to the lady who has been the ever present, ever green, uh, ever full of energy, uh, Sonny, um, for the 10 years that the British and Professional Women's Group has been um, uh, in development, and it remains in development, I know, because she has such tremendous further ambitions for the, uh, for, for the growth of this particular group. Um, perhaps while we're trying to get her back, um, I know one thing that Sonny would be doing uh, would be, again, thanking our 
partners uh, for today's session, and they're the British School Jakarta, some clips in the background, uh, Brompton, Cushman and Wakefield, uh, Michael Page Indonesia, and Shell Indonesia as well. Um, Sonny, are you back with us? No. I, Ambassador, I, I'm just wondering if you might have one particular question you would like to just throw out to the floor, um, just while Sonny is obviously trying to reconnect with us. Thanks for the chance, Chris. Uh, my, my question is a simple one, really. Um, how can men who aspire to be allies uh, in this work uh, best assist, best help um, the process which uh, which this group is, is, is established to set up? Not, not in a discriminatory or a divisive way, but to make sure that that inclusion and equality is is mainstreamed in everything we do. What what's the best thing that that somebody like me can can do in that context? Um, <clears throat> who, who would like to lead in, in an answer with that? Maybe shall we hear? I try to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Please, please go ahead. Yeah, so thank you, Ambassador, for, um, you know, being an ally. You already are by being here and offering your, your pledge to have uh, women in future panels or meetings. That's a great starting point. Um, as I said, you know, diversity is on both sides. It's not just, you know, women needs to be treated differently. We all recognize, you know, we are wired differently as to gender, and we all bring something into uh, the equation. So to be able to first to recognize we are different, but at the same time, value that difference in your decision making as a leader and in your decision, uh, uh, in the power that you have, to be able to creating that enabling um, environment that, you know, the, the panel being an example, but other things, you know, when you consider decision making, when you making decisions to ask for different perspective, uh, maybe make an effort to ask for your female uh, um, team members about their views, yeah, and creating that uh, environment where, you know, men and women can be mentor and coach for each other, because we needed to recognize we are different, but we should be value our difference and leverage that difference for better decision making. I think as a leader, you have tremendous um, capability and power to creating that in enabling environment. Thank and thank Chris, if I could... Uh, Roro, SD, would you like to add something? Yes. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Ambassador, thank you for the question. And it's actually quite an important one. Um, I think, um, you know, your commitment in, in seeing more women within uh, panel discussions going forward is a step forward in itself. Um, and I think um, aside from doing that, is also uh, in, in allowing women to voice their opinions and, and to really just listen uh, for that to then be accounted within any kind of decision making processes. Um, I see there are a lot of improvements already being made. Um, actually, if I can give the context of, you know, um, what it's like right now in the Indonesian parliament, I think women are very vocal <laughs> with a lot of issues and, uh, you know, they are very much being heard and are a big part, of course, of the decision making processes in which I feel can also be implemented um, across industries. So not only in parliament, but really just across across government bodies and industries um, alike. And I think another on a personal level, um, um, you know, giving enough support uh, to either, you know, your, your wife or your daughter, you know, um, and because that this is the kind of support I've been getting from from my parents, uh, for, for me to be brave enough, actually, to venture off into the political space, um, and, and creating the changes that I'm able to create uh, right now as a parliamentarian. And that all stemmed from this incredible immense support from my father from my brother of course who are male um you know counterparts in this and also my mother of course uh, so family um i think uh, support is is very very important in in creating future leaders of either indonesia or the world going forward karina do do you feel that there is 
uh, additional type of support uh, within your sector um, that men could and should be giving to create more balance, more opportunity? Uh, what are your thoughts? Um, in film industry, I think uh, more because in the long term, I think in the future, I want to be a, a movie producer also. Uh, yeah, it's still not that much uh, a women film producer here. Uh, some of the bigger production house still look, still underestimate women producer that will not make a good one, except for the one who already established like Mia Dinata or I, I think only and only Tehnia Dinata, there's no one else. So yeah, I think it more to to uh, to the makers, not only the actress, you know, the, the directors, the producers. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Uh, mm -hmm. I noticed we have got Sonny back. Sonny, yes. we've been having a great chat about you behind your back while you've been <laughs> away. Um, my apologies, yes, uh, my, uh, my sincere apologies for the internet uh, downfall. <laughs> It's okay. And while we were talking, we, we cut the recording as well. So there's no evidence of anything that was said. Um, yeah. I, I was saying, I was saying what a wonderful, uh, what a wonderful role and role model you have been through your leadership of Brit Cham's professional women's group over 10 years. Um, I, I said an awful lot more than that. I know time is very, very tight. Um, and, and you like to offer your own clothes. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you again to Ambassador uh, Owen Jenkins. Thank you so much for uh, giving us that uh, closing remarks. Thank you, Chris, for all the support all these last 10 years. And, you know, I wouldn't have been able to do this without the Bridgecham team. The events team has been amazing. And I think I shared with people before when the pandemic started, I was actually very nervous to do online Zoom events. And they were the ones who held my hand and said to me, fine, Boo, you are always a, a networker, you can do this. And so it really, uh, you know, everybody needs teamwork. No one can do anything alone. And our tagline is really to challenge ourselves. So to all the women and all the men who are joining us today, I would like to remind you of today's beautiful, uh, you know, uh, mantra for the International Women's Day worldwide. And that is take a challenge, you know, challenge yourself to grow, challenge yourself to step out of your comfort zone and challenge yourself to stand up for what is not right in today's world. And then if you'd like a community that will help you to support you and encourage you in your growing and your changing and your journey in your career everyday life, please join our community, the British Chamber Professional Women Group. And uh, we have monthly events and we will be sharing our events on uh, uh, through email as well as it is on our website and on our Facebook. Thank you to all our speakers. Thank you to Xiao Wei for joining us from Singapore. And thank you to Roro Esti for taking time out of your busy schedule. Thank you to Alamanda who's already left us because she had another webinar. And thank you to Karina for sharing your insights and, uh, you know, on being a celebrity and how tough it is during this COVID. You know, let's all reach out, let's all celebrate. And at the end of it, I would just like to remind you, make each day worth celebrating. It doesn't have to be just, you know, the International Women's Day that we celebrate, you know, us. Let's celebrate every day that we are alive and let us celebrate every day that we can make a difference to this world. Thank you and see you at our next event. Bye-bye. Thank you.